Yes, it's now on. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Global Network webinar. My name is Panya Yu, and I will be moderating this webinar together with my colleagues, Alexander Loschke, Sean Lowell, and Charlotte Taglioni. This webinar is jointly organized by the Global Network of Data Officers and Statisticians, along with the Inter-Secretariat Working Group on Household Surveys. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the Global Network, we are an online professional network of just over 2,500 statisticians, data officers, data scientists, and geospatial information experts. We use our group hosted on Jammer to network, collaborate, provide technical support, and share knowledge with each other. If you're not a member already, please join us by going to www.jammer.com forward slash UN stats. Uh, before I introduce the topic and speaker, I'd like to now invite my colleague Charlotte Taglioni to say a few words of introduction about our co-host, the Inter-Secretariat Working Group on Household Surveys. Over to you, Charlotte. Thank you very much, Payam. Good morning to you all. So uh, I'm Charlotte Taglioni. I'm a statistician in the Inter-Secretary Working Group for Household Surveys. <clears throat> which is a group which was established in 2015 by the Statistical Commission. We currently have 11 international agency and 10 country uh, member countries in our group. And um, uh, our, our goal is to foster coordination and cooperation in the planning, funding and implementation of household surveys. We also promote the harmonization of survey method and instrument and we uh, we're very interested and we advocate for any methodological development or innovation that can be of interest for household surveys. So please feel free to, to reach out if you uh, if you want for, I mean, any webinar or, uh, I mean, th things you could share on uh, methodological innovation or household survey. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Charlotte. So now on to business. Uh, today, we are very delighted to have with us Professor Cinzia Cirillo from the University of Maryland's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. Uh, Cinzia will be presenting on traditional and emerging sources of data for transportation analysis. Her presentation will cover household survey, travel survey, time use survey, stated preference methods, and big data from probe vehicle and GPS trajectories. The main transportation system performance indicators will be introduced and methods for large scale transportation models briefly described. A statewide micro simulation model that combines land use, transportation choices, and agent based transportation simulation will be illustrated. Finally, these tools will be demonstrated in the context of transportation and equity. The case study evaluates the effects of complete streets on the willingness to walk and bike and the different levels of traffic stress. Uh, let me now introduce our speaker. Cynthia Cirillo is a professor at the University of Maryland, Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. She has been recently nominated the Interim Director of Maryland Transportation Institute. Congratulations. Uh, she is an active member of the travel behavior community. Her work has focused on the fundamentals of disciplines, discrete choice analysis, survey methodologies, including national travel surveys and stated preference and activity-based modeling. More recently, Cinzi is collaborating across disciplines and the topics of data linkage and small area estimation and on energy and climate change. Before we go on to the presentation, just some housekeeping reminders. Since you will have 35 to 40 minutes to present, we will then have a Q&A session following her presentation. Throughout the presentation, please feel free to actually use uh, the chat box uh, in Teams to write your comments and questions. And during the Q&A session, you could either ask the questions directly, or if you wish, we could also read out the questions on your behalf. Just let us know. As always, this Global Network webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the Global Network at www.jammer.com forward slash UNSTATS. 
we invite you to continue the discussions on the global network after this webinar. And with that, we are very much looking forward to hearing from you, Simzia. The floor is yours. Thank you. Um, going to share the screen. All right, I think everything is good. Um, thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be part of this uh, uh, global network webinar. And uh, I'll be pleased, I'm pleased to present um, uh, the major sources of data that we use in transportation, why we use these sources of transportation, and how we use them for policy and planning. So, I've prepared a mix of um, traditional data, which included the National Household Travel Survey and the American Time Use Survey. Uh, I will introduce some emerging data for which the University of Maryland is pioneer. So we have GPS trajectory data, which is part of a project called NextGen, the vehicle prop data. And then you will see how all this data are used to produce an agent-based model that simulate the mobility of people at state level. Um, and this is kind of a digital or statistical twin, uh, given that I am with statistician this morning. So you will see the results of this. I've changed a little bit the content because we just got new results from this micro simulation. And I thought it would be interesting for you to see visually at, um, the results of our um, data analysis and models. All right, so um, I want to see that a lot that you will see here, it's uh, relative to the, um, to the United States where I'm working for, where I've been working for the last 16 years. However, I've participated in study about National Household Travel Survey a little bit everywhere in the world. I started in Belgium, I worked with the German National Household Travel Survey, UK National Household Travel Survey, France, France um, National Household Travel Survey, and recently, I've been involved in a number of projects in the Middle East where there is a need to have good quality, good data for their, um, for their project. They are building new cities and new transportation system. So they, really, uh, they are really desperate to have good quality data. So in the US, um, another thing I want to say is that the National Household Travel Survey, although it's not standardized across country, the way it is collected and the output of the data collection is similar across countries, at least in countries where they have been conducting this survey for a long time. So in the US, the National Household Travel Survey is conducted by the Federal Highway Administration, and it's a nationally representative survey of travel behavior. So remember, NHTS is representative at the national level. Uh, the last one we collected, uh, the National Household Travel Survey, was in 2017. So this is, was before COVID. And prior to that, there were other, um, so there were similar uh, surveys, but this, of, or, of course, has evolved over time. And you see that we collect household travel survey every six, eight, sometimes 10 years, which has important implication, for example, now with COVID, we don't know how um, behavior has changed, uh, as um, travel behavior has changed as a consequence of COVID. And see that between 2009 and 2017, a number of technology started to be available, like electric vehicle, hybrid vehicle. We had the mobil uh, shared mobility appearing, and we had no data about that. So this is a limitation of the way we collect household travel surveys. Now, uh, the other thing is the scale. Um, so the NHTS can produce robust estimates of major travel indicators at census region or division or metropolitan area. If you go down to smaller area, your results will be not very good and you will start to have a lot of variance around the mean. So uh, the NHTS says that you need to be particularly careful when you analyze behavior of group of people, for example, low income people, or less common of forms of transportation, like bicycle, Uber or Lyft, or even transit, which has a very more small model share in the US. Data is made publicly available, 
on the Oak Ridge uh, National Lab website. So the data is organized that way. So you have an household file with the main household characteristics, mainly social demographic. You have a personal file where you have the characteristic of each individual in the household. So you have information about every single individual aged um, higher than six years old. Then you have a vehicle file when you have information about all the vehicle in the household by make, model, model year, uh, annual miles traveled, odometer readings. And as you can imagine, this is a very important source of information for everything is related between, uh, for everything related to energy and transportation. It gives you an idea of how much we consume for, uh, transport, for private transportation. And also it's important for greenhouse gas emission calculation. So attached to the person file, you also have a travel day trip file in which um, the, um, the respondents um, report all their trip. And uh, this is a little bit the size, an idea about the size of the household. So in 2017, we had about 130,000 household, 264,000 persons, 256,000 vehicles, and close to a million trips. So of course, the peculiarity of this survey is in the vehicle trips, in which we want to know everything about the mobility of the household, including the time the trip begins and ends, trip length, composition of travel party, transportation mode, um, trip uh, purpose, um, number of transit trips, work and bike trips. So this is very important for us in order to understand the mobility of the people. Okay, so which are the indicators that we follow over time and that um, we mainly uh, calculate from, a, uh, from the household travel survey? So uh, you see that these are the indicators over time. So this is really an indication of uh, how our society has changed. Particularly remarkable is the number of vehicle per household that went from 1.16 in 69 to 1.88 and seems to be very stable. You see a little bit of decline in 2009, but everybody remembers here the, the economic crisis. So this is an indication of the economic crisis. Usually we have two driver license per household, so two adults, two, license, uh, two uh, driving licenses. Uh, you see that the number of work per household has not increased a lot from 121 in 69 to 1.53 in 2017. However, the number of vehicles per workers went from less than one to 1.5. So these are more trip-related um, trip indicators, and uh, these are things that uh, are very important to us. So the first column after the uh, years, you see the number of trips per day. This, for a person like me, the number of trips per day is kind of a magic number. It tells me if uh, the survey went uh, well or wrong. And the, the magic number that I'm expecting, uh, considering that there is always a little bit of underreporting now, nowadays, is about four, a little bit more than four. You see that from 69 to, to today, uh, we have, we, we are from, we went from two trips, which was the nine to five jobs, right? People were going to work and coming back home to almost four trips, to four trips or higher than four trips in 2001. Then you observe uh, a decline. This can be due to the fact that more people are working from home, uh, there is e-commerce, but the number for 2017 has been the subject of major debate. 3.37 is really low. We think that something went very, very wrong with this survey. And in my opinion, one of the causes of that is because we changed the mode of survey. So we went from CATI, computer assisted telephone interview, to a web based survey. So for the statistician out there, um, I think there is, a, so there is a need to understand why this happened. Um, the second column is daily uh, person miles traveled um, daily. And you see that. Again, a huge increase between the 70 and now. Now we drive about 
um, so the, the, we we travel about 36 miles per day. Uh, these are the end of which about 26 are uh, by driving. The average person trip per length is about 10 miles, 10, 11 miles, of which about 10 are uh, with car. Okay, so this slide summarizes a little bit what is the paradise for people like me, transportation modeler and planners. So at the end of the day, you want to be able to reconstruct this training for all the people uh, in your uh, population of interest. So you see here a very complicated trip training. This uh, person has nine trips, and we are interested mainly in knowing what time this happens, what is the origin, what is the destination, how many people were together in this trip, and uh, which mode of transportation was chosen in order to do all these activities. You see that the activities we uh, we kind of have a, um, we we have a group of activities. So uh, um, we assume that trip can start from fixed basis like home or work, and then uh, people travel for education, school, for shopping, going to stores, go to work, and do other personal business like going to the bank or having fun. Uh, for example, having lunch outside. So remember that this is what a transportation person is interested in. So the purpose of the National Household Travel Survey is to serve this kind of um, exercise, understand how people move between places, how and with whom, and that was it. All right, I was asked here to uh, also talk about the American Time News Survey. I'm not an expert in American Time News Survey, Although we have some publication with the American Time News Survey, and I will say that the two surveys are similar, although they have a lot of differences. First of all, the American, the American Time News Survey is, um, has information about one person in the household, so it does not interview all the uh, components of the household, which was the case of the uh, travel survey. And um, it asks people about the time uh, spent doing various activities, such work, child care, housework, watching television, volunteering, and socializing. So at the end of the day, we can reconstruct the same indicators with the National Household Travel Survey. And in fact, uh, when I was um, a postdoc, I did an exercise. We collected data from the National Household Travel Survey. and um, we compared the time spent at work with the time use survey, and we found exactly the same hours spent at work, which was about seven hours. This was Belgium, not the United States, of course, where you will find a much higher number of hours spent at work. Um, I will skip all this. Um, uh, the files, the structure of the files is pretty much complex. You have uh, six files that need to be joined in order to do your analysis, but everything is documented, everything is standardized. So once you get familiar, it is possible to do all the analysis. And the output of the time use survey is usually like that, right? We want to know on a certain uh, time period how uh, people with certain uh, social, uh, social demographic characteristics spend their time. So here, for example, we have the difference between the time spent by a male on different activity and the time spent by a female on the same activity. And this makes um, usually on the newspaper all the time, right? Okay, so um, the problem with the, why I cannot use the American Time Use Survey for my model, mainly because, so couple of limitations. One, I don't have information for all the people in the household. The second one is that I don't have the, location where the activities are um, done. So it, it, I know that, for example, they are doing uh, socializing at home or socializing at friends' place, but in transportation, I needed to know geographically where this is. Uh, so I needed to know if this place belonged to a certain, I, ideally, I will need the geographical coordinates, which I never have because of a privacy issue. But um, in practice, 
um, usually I have a census tract or I have a zip code, and this is not available in the American Time Use Survey. So what is very interesting in the Time Use Survey is that they have a special module, and uh, we have used the well-being module, um, which is a module that contains information about how people felt during selected activity and general health information. Or the leave module that it was about uh, wage and salary of workers uh, that took an unpaid leave. And uh, from 2014 to 2016, they had um, modules about eating and health. And this came through the time. And these are usually very unique um, information. I think I needed to go faster. All right, now um, these are kind of the traditional data that uh, we use, but now there is a, a need to um, see what is are the opportunity given by emerging sources of data. So uh, the University of Maryland is conducting by um, uh, uh, on behalf of Federal Highway Administration this next gen project, in which um, the idea is to um, use GPS trajectory from a mobile phone company to, um, to, um, to see how people move around. And in particular, the first objective is to build this origin destination table across about 550 zones in the US. So how this works? Uh, so you don't collect data, so this is not a survey. We buy data from telephone companies uh, we process the data according to um, certain quality metrics. Of course, this data is very messy. Uh, we try to identify home and work location and see if there is any duplication because we buy data from different providers and people have uh, more than one phone you, sometimes. Uh, you see that we don't have social demographics here. Um, so then once this is processed, we try to identify two rim trips, uh, the travel mode, the trip linking, uh, work type, uh, trip purpose, trip distance, and weighting and, and expansion to have kind of a representative sample of the population. Uh, then a lot of calibration and validation goes into this. And finally, we have this OD, uh, so it's the number of trips between these zones in the US. As you see, the zones are quite large for now. This is an idea of uh, how the cleaning process is done to, to get a reasonable quality data. Um, so yeah, uh, these are the numbers you see that. Um, we, for example, we have for, uh, for each um, user, active user, about 24 days. Uh, the number of devices that has at least seven days or more is just 20%. And many of these devices, they just appear once or twice in our database. This is um, a, uh, this summarizes the information that we get at the end for a particular zone. Uh, we do the same for tracks. Um, for now, the process is a little bit um, um, less complicated, and we produce all the um, tables also for tracks. Okay, I know that a lot of you um, are in developing countries, and uh, I have students from Africa who prepare these slides because I asked them, is it possible to apply this in, uh, in Africa, where, of course, um, the official, uh, official data for official statistics is limited? And he, uh, he gave me these slides and he said that just 46% of Africans sub subscribe to mobile services, which is much lower than here in the US. There is limited access to smartphone, limited access to internet connection, limited number of people who turn on the GPS during mobility, um, lack of available infrastructure to store, monitor, and, and evaluate data trends. So although, uh, so the conclusion, according to my student, is that although there is potential, uh, technology is still not there for this kind of exercises in, uh, exercise in Africa. Um, so this is another data set that we have here at the University of Maryland, and uh, it's unique. Uh, so um, the, in, here at the University of Maryland, we have a center called 
Center for Advanced and Transportation Technology. And they uh, store uh, big traffic data, especially from this vehicle prop data project, which is relatively recent, started in 2008. And uh, so this, uh, this center, they store and they, love, and, uh, they work with uh, vehicle prop data, which are generated by global positioning system devices um, in, in vehicles. And so um, they um, observe where vehicles are at certain times and calculate their speed. And this location, speed, and heading are um, stored in our servers. Um, in particular, <coughs> excuse me. In particular, we have this NPMRDS data that uh, reports the observed travel time in seconds for all TMC, so TMC is a small segment in which um, the entire uh, US network has been divided. And so for each of these small segments, we have travel times uh, for every five minutes coming. And this is, um, this is to monitor the status of congestion around network. And uh, yeah, this is, you see how small, this is an example of how small uh, these segments are. So imagine how many segments we, we have in the United States. And again, this is, um, this is, this covers all the segments or all the roads in the United States. To give you an idea, we work uh, with uh, 2,654 uh, roadway segments uh, covering 2,000 miles of roadway in Maryland. And this time we worked with even more granular data that was uh, recorded every minute. And so this meant that we were working with almost 4 million records per day uh, for that project. All right, now uh, I think I will spend the last 10 minutes talking about what we do with the data. So uh, I'm going to present one of the most advanced state-of-the-art model uh, that uh, can be, that it's built according to the uh, data and technological ability, technological ability that we have. So uh, together with my group, uh, we have spent the last three years building uh, this kind of integrated model in which uh, what we do is that we try to combine a land use model. Land use model means that um, you, you, you know everything about the population, where they live, where they work, uh, their age, uh, their um, uh, professional status, and you know, have, you also have indication about how the land is used, uh, construction, renovation, demolition, etc. And so this, this describes people and the land use, silo. Then we have a module that um, uh, simulate their travel choices. Remember that I wanted to know time of day, mode choice, destination, travel time budget, and trip generation. So all these uh, are estimated using the household travel survey. And uh, we assign with Maxim, which is an, an AJ-based micro simulation, we assign the, this uh, mobility to the network. Okay, to give you an idea, um, this is Maryland. Uh, we work with about 60, uh, 1,600 zones, of which 1,200 are in Maryland, the rest are the rest of the world. Although we are trying to get rid of the zoning system and try really to work with geographical coordinates, this is our uh, next um, uh, improvement of this model. You see that this is the high, uh, uh, highway network, very dense. And unfortunately, this is the public transit network, the stops, you see that is much less dense. All right, so uh, what we do, we generate a synthetic population of person and household. We have about 6 million people uh, and we generate uh, population by age, gender and car ownership, employment type. Then we generate the dwelling, uh, so dwelling vacancy, non-residential vacancy and change in housing costs. Then we have re-estimated the mode choice. So the mode choice is a model that tells you for a certain trip, uh, which mode you are going to use. And we have as a mode, auto driver, auto passenger, uh, bicycle, bus, train, metro, and walk. And we have a number of social demographic characteristics for that. 
And this is the results. So you see the mode share for home-based work, which is the first pie. You see that many people um, drive, which is what we expect, right? Um, for home-based data, there are many more uh, uh, passengers because probably people go together to shopping. And for non-home-based work, um, these, are, these, are, these are the results. So again, this comes from models estimated from the National House Private Sector. So the final output of um, MITO is the number of trips for each zones and by purpose. And we, we, we were pretty happy about this because the model says that we have in average 4.2 trips per person, which is exactly the magic number I was talking about in the beginning. This is the output of MITO. And then all this goes into a um, simulator and the simulator uh, creates events. Events are uh, trips. And um, the, there is a scoring system inside Matsim that gives positive utility to people when they perform activity, like we enjoy, um, well, not going to work, but uh, shopping or um, having fun. Negative utility for traveling. We don't like to be stuck in traffic. Negative utility for monetary costs, tolls, fare a negative utility for arriving late or early. So all this goes into this simulator. And um, let me see if I can, okay. Well, let me explain. So this is a visualization tool. In this first um, video, you will see the activity uh, as the day goes on. So let me start in the beginning. So see that we are starting at 8 a.m. So the light blue are work activity, dark blue are home, and um, uh, yellow is shopping activity, and the white are uh, other activities. So again, this is very preliminary uh, results, but this is to give you an idea of the digital twin or statistical twin that we have, um, that we have created. It goes very fast. We are still um, trying to get adjusted to this uh, software. <laughs> so this is about activities. The second one is about vehicle. You, you will see vehicle. You can recognize, well, if you are not familiar with Maryland, this is the network of Maryland, and you see the these uh, green things moving are the vehicles moving on the network. The round thing is the beltway around Washington, D.C. All right, I think uh, this ends my presentation and I'm uh, willing to take questions. Thank you so much, Sincere, for a very comprehensive presentation. It's very interesting to see how creative uh, you got in trying to get hold of some of these non-traditional data sources and also some of the results from the simulations. These are really interesting as well. So let me now actually turn on uh, the ability to ask questions. Um, as I said from the very beginning, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask the questions yourself, uh, you could do that now. Just give me one second. But you could also um, type in your questions in the chat and I could read them out. Uh, let me start perhaps since you with a couple of questions that have been uh, posted in the comment. So one of the questions is about the GPS trajectory data that you touched on in your presentation. And the question is, are the phone GPS data based on call detail records? 
CDR or passive signaling. Um, and then we have a second question about basically the results of the simulation. Are there any interesting stable conditions uh, in the simulation? So let's start with those two. Okay, so the GPS trajectory are uh, passive data. So for the fact that you are carrying with you a, a, a phone, uh, you are tracked. And so um, what they uh, see is where you are at what time. So then we can see if you are doing an activity in a certain place or if you are traveling. It's not when people make a telephone call. Mm -hmm. And the second question is, well, the, the, the results that you have seen are for an average day. We don't have the we don't have um, way to simulate a particular thing. So we assume that this is an average day in the life of, of a, a resident in Maryland, and that's what you see from the the simulation. What we are going to uh, why we want this because we are going to simulate new scenarios. For example, we want to see if by improving uh, by adding a new line, a metro line, we have a new metro line in construction. We want to see how many people are going to use that metro line. Or, for example, we want to uh, improve uh, the walkability of places, and uh, we want to use this kind of tool to um, analyze these policies. Thank you. So the, the cameras and the microphones are now open, so please feel free to just raise your hands if you have any questions that you want to ask live. Uh, for now, maybe, maybe another question that we received in the pre-registration, and this also is something that you mentioned briefly about data availability. Uh, the question is about, can we adapt these methods for country where there is a problem with availability of data? I mean, specifically, as I was listening to your presentation, uh, about Africa, for example, it's true that smartphone penetration is still relatively low on the continent, but mobile phone concentration in general is relatively high, uh, even now, right? It, it's quite ubiquitous. I wonder if you have heard of any instances where instead of GPS uh, trajectories, some sort of location data from cell towers could be used instead to kind of try to estimate how people move. Um, that is to say, instead of data from smartphones, data that you could get from carriers uh, based on cell towers instead, uh, but or, or any other really creative uses of, of uh, yeah. data really uh, in those countries. I think this high penetration rate uh, can be achieved just with smartphone. Uh, there have mm. been other attempts to give people GPS uh, and follow them. Uh, what we have observed is that um, we always were able to get small sample, not big data of this size. So I will say, yes, it's feasible uh, not to use smartphone, but you don't have the penetration and uh, the vo volume of data like we have for uh, with GPS, uh, with smartphone based GPS. Thank you. So for for your own experience working with uh, mobile phone data in the US, uh, are you talking about carriers? Are you talking about um, who, who exactly are you getting these data sets from and what are the arrangements that you you have with them? Just, just interested in uh, the logistics of getting the data sets. Well, uh, this is a good question because uh, first of all, we buy that data. The data is not for free and it's pretty expensive. Uh, and you need to store the data, uh, which is um, in also you need the infrastructure for that. Uh, and you need infrastructure to be able to um, manipulate the data. All this costs quite a lot of money. Um, we get the data from different telephone provider. In the US, there are not many. So we have a contract with about two or three telephone provider. And this gives us a good coverage of the population, very high percentages like, 60-70%. Let me pause for a minute to see if there's any live questions that attendants would like to ask. Uh, please do raise your hand or just basically unmute your mic and, and ask your questions if you have any. I see a hand up from Alexander. Go ahead, Alexander. 
Thank you, and thank you to Cynthia for the presentation. My name is Alex Blackburn, and I'm a transport statistician in Geneva. Um, thank you for the answer on the uh, type of mobile phone data. Um, I, I saw you present on the use of the GPS devices in cars, and we've seen a similar project in Germany where they use floating car data um, to produce origin destination matrices. Um, my question kind of relates to that, and it's um, I see these origin destination matrices used a lot in transportation planning, but less so in official statistics because there's question marks about how accurate you can get them when you go down to um, th they'll give you a good description of the entire region, but much less so when you look at smaller regions. I, I was just wondering on your views on that and just also to say that it was nice to see a presentation about travel surveys as well and one of the things we're doing is try to see how we integrate the two different data sources uh, mobile phone data might be, give us a lot of value but they're not going to answer the questions like on uh, gender breakdowns and things so uh, i'd be happy to be in touch with you in the future on this and uh, see where that can take us thank you yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, yesterday I was um, at dinner with the statisticians and we had actually a text from uh, um, a German professor and he was dealing exactly with this uh, uh, problem of OD uh, estimation, OD trips estimation. So in, um, I'm not an expert in that because my uh, expertise is more in demand modeling and this is analysis. But in transportation, there is a huge literature on OD estimation. And uh, OD uh, and zone are sometimes small and many. So there is a huge literature on that. Again, I'm not an expert, but um, there, for statistician, maybe it's good to see what transportation people have done. Um, concerning the linkage, I think this is the future. Uh, the, the future will be to take advantage of the um, of the strength of each, each of these data sets, the surveys, the GPS data, and try to link them together. And actually, we are working on this, uh, but they, we are in preliminary stages because we just got access to the GPS data. So I will be uh, um, happy to be in touch with you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy, and thank you, Alex, for the question. I also have a hand up from Michael, Michael Mulbauer. Michael, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, thank you for the super uh, interesting presentation. Um, actually, I'm trying to estimate OD uh, matrices with a small area uh, methodology um, using a generalized linear mixed model. And I got a very similar data set as well. I got uh, Mobilität in Deutschland, like Mobility in German survey. And I've got like a million uh, trips as well. And I'm trying to use that trips and some external district level covariates to estimate um, origin destina de destination matrices, basically. So yeah, I'm kind of surprised how fitting this talk was to my research topic. So um, if anyone wants to stay in touch, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, University of Bamberg is the place. Yeah. Which university? Uh, Bamberg. Uh, okay. Uh, Bamberg, yeah. Um, yeah, so thanks for that talk. It was pretty inspiring, cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Michael, for your comment. Uh, are there any other comments or questions? Please just uh, raise your hands using the reactions function at the top of your screen if you have any. While we're waiting, Cynthia, uh, maybe just out of curiosity, how does COVID uh, have an impact on this kind of research that you are doing, <laughs> especially given the fact that um, kind of travel trends and behavior probably change drastically while traditional data sources such as household travel survey don't happen in real time and don't happen uh, that often. Um, what are some of the implications of, of, of these trends these days for your research? 
Well, uh, first of all, I want to say that the GPS data was used to uh, build a COVID dashboard in which a number of indicators were uh, uh, derived from the GPS data. For example, how many people stayed at home? Um, how many people were keeping at a certain distance? So there were a number of indicators that were de derived and used to follow the, the COVID pandemic. Now, um, it's true that we don't have official data. People in transportation have done all kinds of survey, but these are small, not representative of the population. So you read a lot of results, but I won't trust any of them. Um, mm -hmm. What we are seeing from the, um, uh, from the speed data, uh, we are seeing that traffic is back to normal or even uh, higher than before COVID. But uh, you see a spreading of the peak. So there is, not, there is less congestion because people have more flexibility in their travel. So many people, um, so some people are staying home some days, but this doesn't mean that they are staying home and doing nothing. This is compensated by other activities. You, uh, if you don't go to work, you will have other activities with your children. You go more often outside your home. So you don't see much reduction in the number of trips, number of vehicle miles traveled, but you, you, you see a reduction in congestion due to the peak spreading, what we call in transportation. So it means that instead of going to work at eight, I stay home, but then, um, then I, took it, I take a shopping trip at 11 a.m. So this is what we are observing overall. Um, I, don't, I, have, I have not analyzed uh, data in depth, but that's my sense as a transportation expert. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, we still have about 10 minutes left, so continue to type in your questions in, in the chat if you have any, or just raise your hands to ask. We just seem to have a lot of promotion for University of Bamberg in the chat. Uh, apparently, one of our co-leads also from there, so just some, some love there for University of Bamberg. Um, any, any other questions from the attendees? Uh, I want um, to say something that presentation. I want to say. Sure. So concerning the household travel survey, I forgot to say this. Um, they are changing methodology now. So instead of um, collecting data every 10 years, we are going to have smaller um, uh, sample uh, collected every two years. So they have started in mm. 2022. So we will have this year, the first year. The problem is that sample will be small. They are talking about 15,000 every two years which is overall is not a lot. And also they are changing mode of collection. So uh, half will be traditional and the other half will be from a panel. So this will be a non-probability sample. And so this will open up to a number of questions and probably transportation um, people are not equipped to analyze this data. So we will, we will need uh, as, um, advice from you statisticians. Yeah, that's interesting whenever they change the methodology. Um, there is now another question in the chat uh, from Ghana Statistical Service. How best can we use CDR to support traffic survey? And CDR, CDR? I believe, uh, refers to um, call detail records of mobile phones. Well, uh, traffic survey, um, the proper data can be uh, a way. So if you have something like um, the vehicle prop data, which uh, is just uh, reporting the speed of the car, then you can uh, see uh, every kind of a measure of congestion in certain areas. Um, but this data, you know, come without, uh, um, without, you don't really know the origin, the destination, you don't really know the social demographic. So there is a lot of limitation. You have a global idea of what conge where congestion is uh, and um, how bad that congestion is, but not much more than that. You can also use this, for example, for accidents. So congested area tends to be the places where 
accident happens. So th there are way, there are people who are connecting these kind of things, um, but there are limitations about that data. So, I mean, when, when you speak about how the data that you obtain from the telephone providers are messy and have to be really sorted out, uh, uh, and it's very difficult to do those, have you uh, considered maybe getting data directly from Google Maps, Apple Maps, Waze, or any of those other kind of navigational uh, 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 platforms? Would that help? Or would, would it really not make that much of a difference compared to the data you're already getting? I think it's not the same kind of data. So if you want the, this kind of data, you should go to the, this telephone provider. I am not mm. aware of what kind of data you get from Google. Uh, probably Google has something similar, our vehicle prop data, uh, the, the, which our provider is Inrix and TomTom. Tom. Uh, and I, I, for example, Waze, they use the same data. And I believe Google, or, well, Google, they get data from their users. But it's similar. The concept is similar. So if okay. you want the trajectory, this is telephone mobile provider. If you want vehicle prop data, your sources are Inrix, um, TomTom, probably Google. All right. We probably have have time for uh, one or two more questions. So if there are any, uh, please do go ahead and type them in or raise your hands. If not, perhaps uh, one last question for myself about the result of the simulations. Since here, are there any surprises that you see from the initial analysis? Uh, actually, we are surprised how well it's doing without too much calibration and validation. We were expecting much messier results, but we have not. This we have, you know, this is a huge. Um, this was a huge investment for my group. We are just getting the. Um, the preliminary results and honestly we are very surprised how well it's do, doing in terms of the indicators that we have in mind and probably because uh the 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 k the quality of the data and the quality of the model that they're um, in the input of this um, micro simulator is really make a difference so that's pleasant surprise. That's the best kind of surprise. I'm glad to hear. So what, what's next for your uh, research group? What, what are so, some of the plans you have for the future? Yeah, so we are working a lot. Um, uh, we, we are working on data linkage, so we would like to link together uh, trajectories, um, trajectories, um, uh, surveys and population synthesizer. So this is a part of my group is working on that and uh, uh, working on this uh, micro simulator and uh, try to get good results and probably transfer it to other places like as i was saying in middle east where um, i've been working a lot lately that's exciting so one last question from the chat since you are, are the tools that you use for your simulation analysis are they all open source yes they are uh, actually maxim is not our own um, None of this module is our own. However, in order to adapt and be able to run these things, there is a huge cost, initial cost. So all the tools are available. Actually, our tool will be available in the GitHub of Matsim. But um, having all these things uh, integrated together and running requires high level of expertise and quite a lot of investment in terms of time. Great, thank you. So we have just a couple of minutes left. If there are no more questions, uh, what I would like to ask all participants is to turn on your camera and uh, unmute yourself and help me give a big round of applause to our presenter today. Don't be shy. Uh, we want to see faces and not just all these uh, black screens. Thanks, Cynthia. Really good presentation. Thank you for having Thank me. You very much. It was a pleasure. So I hope you, you uh, found the presentation useful. As I said, 
the recording and the PowerPoint will be shared on the global network. If you're not a member already, do go there and sign up www.jammer.com forward slash uh, UNStats. The link is in the chat. Uh, now, all that remains for me is to really thank you so much, Sincere, for taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to share with us your exciting research agenda. And uh, we hope to hear more from you as you continue with your with your future plans. For now, from all of us at the Global Network, uh, we really appreciate it. And thank you so much. And good day to all. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.